Well, first of all, um, thanks very much to the graduate study for inviting me to give a talk here. Um, and congratulations to all of you who have been accepted into the graduate program at Western, one of the best universities in Canada, you know. Our standard is very high, so you must be very good. Okay. But I'm not sure whether you know the difference between undergraduate program and graduate programs. I'm not very sure that you know that being a graduate student, your main task is doing research. I'm not very sure you know how to do research or how to do better research and what your future will be after you being a researcher here. So therefore, I'm giving a talk here called Crafting Your Research Future. Well, the talk is actually based on a book my co-author and I wrote a year ago. It's called Crafting Your Research Future, a guide to successful master and PhD uh, degrees in science and engineering. Now, even though this book is for science and engineering mostly, but it's actually applied to all graduate students in different disciplines. So some of you may say, well, wait a minute, Dr. Ling. Are you trying to sell your book here? <laughs> we are smart, you know? <laughs> We're graduate students now. Well, I want to tell you that as a Western student, you can actually download the book free. <laughs> If you go to your Western's network, okay, not from your home, but at Western's network, and you can search the book or go to my home page, you will be linking to the publisher's website where you can download the book, the PDF file, free of charge. Okay. Not only that, after the talk, we will have about 15 books, the printed version of the book, available outside free to give it to you. If you like to read the real version, the, the printed copy. Okay, so some basics. Okay. What is graduate study? Right. What, is, what would you do in graduate, as a graduate student? Well, put in one word, you try to learn how to do research under the supervision of supervisors. That's your main task. Okay. And what's your future like? Well, after you graduate, if you are a master's student, you are like a part-time researcher. Okay? You can do some research. Maybe in various companies, they have some researcher's position that you require to do some research. If you are a PhD student, then usually after you graduate, you become a full-time researcher. You could be, for example, postdoc, professors, or scholars, and also, Many companies, large companies, they also, have, they also hire researchers or scientists to do research. So you will be more or less as a doing research as your career. So wait a minute, what is research then after all this? Well, in one word, a research or doing research is to make novel and significant contributions to knowledge. So you say, what's the difference between this and my undergrad study? Well, in your undergraduate study, you are more like receiving knowledge, right? But as a graduate student, you are outputting knowledge. You are making contributions to the, to the society. And, and this contribution of knowledge could be in science, engineering, could be in art, could be in humanity, all different areas. So here, there are two important keywords. One is novel, the other is significance. Novel could also be called new, original, innovative, groundbreaking, creative, etc. Okay? Well, in academics or in research, novel usually means that it has not been published previously in peer review journals or magazines, academic venues. Why peer reviews? Well, in research or academics, we usually have very high standard. We want our peers to review our work to make sure that it is true, it is rigorous. Okay, so that's, otherwise we do not call this as published yet, and you can still do the work. Well, the other keyword is significant or impactful or useful or beneficial. 
Well, what does that mean? Well, usually it means it's better than the state of the art. It's better than the best, than the current best. Okay. Or in future years, maybe your work could be cited or used by many other researchers or papers. And if your graduate work contain novel and significant work, then you should really try to publish it, your thesis, in peer-reviewed venues. And after it is published, it is no longer novel. And other people will have to then step on your shoulder, per se, try to use your work and making further progress. So research is this cycle of making novel and significant contributions to the knowledge. Well, both novelty and significance are very important. You cannot miss one. Okay. So I have some questions for you, right? Can you think of something that is significant but not novel anymore? Can you? Very good. Sure, you can see it's very simple, right? A lot of the published stuff we know uh, must be novel, must be very significant, but not novel anymore. For example, I have here one example, okay? The most famous equation, E equals mc squared. Einstein discovered this in 1905. It was novel at that time, and its significance is still felt today. Now, so if your thesis is to discover e, e equal to mc squared, I'm sure you will not pass the defense. <laughs> unless, unless you figure out an ingenious proof, a new proof perhaps of it. For example, here might be an in, in, ingenious proof. In order to prove e equal to mc squared, you tried e equal to ma squared and you failed. Then you try e equal to mb squared, you failed. And you say, darn, e must be equal to mc squared. So, can you think of something, now this is the harder, something that is novel but not significant? Now when I gave a talk some time ago in another university, a graduate student raised their hand saying, I think my master thesis are like that. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen to you, okay? Well, to give an extreme example. Okay. Here is a thesis title. Here is a thesis that I think is novel, but not significant. This title, and it's written in English. Well, it's just a random stream of letters, actually. And I Googled it this morning, zero result returned. <laughs> so it must be very novel. So you see the difference. Okay, so it's very important to understand this, okay? Now, you may say, how important is my, you know, are the researchers or scholars or scientists in the world? Well, I want to tell you that, you know, from the A&E biography, the top 100 most influential person in the last millennium, dead or alive, five of the top 10 are researchers scientists or scholars, just like you will be. Okay. Which are these fives? Well, I will just show some picture and you can see. I, I, I want to see if you know or not. Who is this person? Galileo, Galileo very good, right? He initiated the scientific revolution. How about this? That's a bit harder. Very good. Okay, Copernicus, he proposed a new model of the universe where the sun is the center. How about this? You must know him. <laughs> e m to m c square. Okay. How about him? Yes, Charles Darwin. He proposed this new idea of the theory of evolution. And how about him? Isaac Newton, yes. He invented calculus law of Newton's law, and various many other things, right? So you can see that all these greatest scientists, they actually contributed novel and significant knowledge to, to a variety of areas. And they also published books or papers about their discoveries. And that, what you need to do in your graduate study, okay? Now some of you may say, 
wait a minute, are you saying that we need to be one, like one of them in order to graduate? Well, my answer to you is, why not? We should try, right? We should always try to, be, to make great, novel, and, and significant discoveries, okay? Well, the important thing is both novelty and significance are not black and white. They're actually graded, okay? You can make more significant or more novel knowledge, contribution to, your, uh, to the knowledge in your thesis. All we are trying to do, including me, is try to move into the scale, into that direction, so that we have more and more novel and more and more significant, okay? Well, I know what my next two books will be. Fifty Shades of Novelty <laughs> and Fifty Shades of Significance. It'll be a trio. Okay, so knowing now what is novel and significant, you know, what's, what will be our ultimate goals as a graduate student? Well, I want to mention there are two important goals. The first goal of graduate students is that in an important, albeit narrow field, which could be your thesis topic, that you are the best in the field at the international level. And this is especially true for PhD students. Let me illustrate. So here, the x-axis is the area. It could be an area or a sub-area in your domain. And the y-axis is, is the expertise. And here is the line for the current best. Okay? If you are a master student, and let's say you take two years to finish, your curve of the knowledge may look like this. In the first year, well, you, took you take courses, and maybe you pick up some area that you're interested in. And then you put in more effort in your second year. You try to make some novel and significant contributions. And here, you may want to publish one or two papers for those that you have discovered. As a mas master's student, there's another alternative, actually. Your two years could be look like this. You may not you know, break the ground but you are making associations with different areas. You are providing new insight in several different areas. So you could also publish a survey paper or a review paper about your, the most state-of-art work. Okay? Well, how about PhD students? Right? I saw that there are a lot of students, masters here, that are wanting to be PhDs in the future. Well, let's say PhD take four years then your four years would look like this. In your first year, you actually have time to explore several different areas or topics. But then you might want to quickly pick up one and focus on it. And in the third year, you try to push that further up. And in the fourth year, you want to really break the ground, establish something new and novel and significant. Okay. So therefore, this peak that passes through the best is the novel and significant contributions your thesis is making. And you will be publishing N papers. This N could be from three to five or whatever, right? And you can probably say you own the area. You can say this area is my baby, okay? Now, when we have this curve, you can see this curve is moving up. So therefore, in mathematics, we have a term called the area under the curve. This, the area under the curve. And you can see that this area under the curve is going up. The, the curve is going up, right? So what this area under the curve represents? It actually represents your effort, okay? You have to put in a lot of effort, basically just to push those, cur those curves up through the four years. Well, some students may not agree with me. Okay? They say that, is it possible that I can spend four years still making significant contributions, but with little effort? Like this. <laughs> you see the area under the curve is very small. I can still go to a party every night. I can tell you that this is impossible. Okay? It's impossible. There's no shortcut to do in terms of doing, doing good research. Well, there are some other students who being, you know, PhD student for four years, but they did I would say a poor thesis. Their curve looked like something like this. 
See, they, in four years, they did explore many different areas, and they put in a lot of effort. However, the problem of this is that they have no focus. They don't break ground in one area. Okay? So this student could earn a few master thesis, but a few master thesis cannot be equal to one PhD. Another potential poor PhD thesis is something like this. Again, in four years, you get a curve like this. The student did even try to publish in several areas. They published in n different topics, and it could also be n different master thesis. But the problem with this kind of thesis is that they are not well established in one. Okay? You want to have that big peak rather than several small ones. Okay, so that's our first goal. That's your first goal. What about the second goal? The second goal is to become an independent researcher, meaning that you become an independent thinker, and you can also carry out research independently. Well, let me use another curve to illustrate. So here is one, two, three, four, four years, and here is dependency, 100% dependency, has a line here. Okay. What we really hope to see is that you will be something like this. At the beginning, you don't know how to do research, but with your supervisor, gradually you become independent. And your supervisor's effort in this case will be like this. Okay. Great. Now, we also see some PhD students whose curve look like this. They are very enthusiastic at the beginning, but then later, it drops like a stone. They quit sometimes, and that's really not good. Okay? When this happens, I can tell you that your supervisor's effort curve and <laughs> insanity <laughs> will be like this. So we don't hope, we hope we don't see this happening, right? Okay, so these are two ultimate goals. One is again, try to make novel and significant contributions in four years, better than the best. The other is become an independent researcher in four years. And you know, that's not very easy. You only have four years. Okay. Well, therefore, in order to do that, I break down the task into three subtasks. Actually, here, I draw a path here, which is probably the same as the grad path that uh, was just mentioned. And here, master or PhD is a milestone, and you're on the way to be a successful researcher. And the first subtask is called find new ideas. You, you want to something new, novel, so therefore there must be some new ideas. And the second is to do solid research. You want to show to your peers that your work is solid. You have a high academic standard. And then the third subtask is to publish papers, publish good papers or top papers. Okay? Now, doing research or getting a degree is not just task one, two, three in sequence. It's actually an iteration of these tasks. In fact, for masters, usually you will iterate one or twice, because again, it's very short. But for PhDs, you should iterate three or six times. Okay? And after this iteration, if you have established already a lot of work, then you can indeed then get a master's or PhD thesis and become a successful researcher. So that's the path to be. Well, I won't have a lot of time to describe these subtasks in great details, but I want to describe to you a few common mistakes or misconceptions while you're doing research, so you pay attention to them during the process. The first bad approach that graduate students often take at the beginning when they read papers. Well, as I said, you want to be best you want to be better than the best. So therefore, the first thing you will do is to read up what's the current status, you know, state of the art. Okay? One bad approach in reading paper is that you try to spend days and sometimes weeks to understand every detail of a paper. That's actually bad. Well, doing research or reading papers is very different from reading textbooks when you're in an undergrad program because there you need to understand better. Here, you really want to spend a small amount of time, maybe 30% of the time, okay, to understand the main idea and the solutions. The other 70% of the time you want to spend on, on two kinds of thinkings. 
The first one is called critical thinking. You want to think, what's wrong with this paper? What's wrong with the method? What's wrong with the assumptions in the paper? Okay. Can I find counterexamples? The second type of thinking is called creative thinking. You want to think, what else? Why not? How can I do it better? Again, you are doing research. You are making novel and significant contributions. You are not just receiving knowledge here. Now, some of you may say, that must be simple. But however, I want to tell you that it's actually not. Some of my graduate students can take half a year to change this mentality. And that's because we, we may have already been used to obeying the authority, perhaps. Or maybe you're already used to everything has a unique solution. So therefore, what else I can do? So therefore, it does take effort to change this. And you know, I think it's actually important to have uh, this critical and cre you know, creative thinking strategies in daily life. Even when you read news, discuss things with people, or, or watching movies. Actually, watching movie, especially science fiction movie, and think what's wrong with the movie and how can I do it better will be a great way to establish your thinking abilities. For example, some of these movies you probably have watched before. Back to the Future, a very good movie, right? I actually made a small assumption on that, you know, when, you, when your car can go faster than the speed of the light, the time can go backward, the Einstein's um, special relativity kind of thing, right? And the movie then make all these interesting consequences. But actually, you can find many plot holes in the movie. And you think, what's wrong with this movie? And how can I do it better? Better than Spielberg, even. How about this movie? Ghost. It made a small assumption. But you can find so many plot holes in the movie. And it's fun to watch and, and, and then think about all these holes. How about this movie? The Da Vinci Code, right? It seemed to be watertight, but they actually find many plot holes. How about this one? There are so many holes in this movie that they're actually holes in the holes. <laughs> <laughs> now, not only you want to be critical to other people's work, one very important aspect is that you want to be critical to your or to our own work. Again, that's because you know, in the scientific academics, we all have very high standard. Okay? You want to think about how can other people attack my ideas, my method, my result, and my paper. And that's very important. Okay, so that's one potential misconception mistake. How about the other one? Well, in finding new ideas, sometimes during the discussion with a supervisor, you come up with some great ideas. But then some student may say, after some literature search that nobody has done that before, they will say, but, 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 nobody has done that before. Can I do it? Well, I want to use Einstein's word to quote. He says, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it? So doing research is to explore an unknown territory. Nobody, including your supervisor, know for sure whether this will work out or not. So being a graduate student, you need to be bold, brave, and risk-taking. Let me make an analogy. Okay. You probably know or have seen this, the Niagara Fall, the beautiful Niagara Fall, two hours drive from here, right? But this picture is slightly different. If you look carefully, you can actually see a little figure here. This is actually Nick Wallander. Last year, in June 15th, he became the first person to cross the Niagara Fall on a high wire. He's the first one. And if you are doing your PhD thesis, you should be like him. <laughs> now the pool you are holding is just like your supervisor. Try to make sure you won't fall, okay? Well, in doing research, some other misconceptions, right? So, Sometimes when you have new ideas, you go and rush to work things out, and it turns out that it doesn't work. So you say, gee, the new idea doesn't work, so therefore I quit. Well, the new idea I mentioned earlier, finding new ideas, is just like a hypothesis. 
this should work, a hypothesis. Maybe in the past, you heard about scientific discovery. It's about to confirm or reject hypothesis. Only two cases, confirm it or reject it. But in research, it's actually more than that. There are actually three cases in real research. Okay? The first case is that you can indeed confirm your hypothesis. That's great. But there are only about 10% of the time that this could happen. They're quite rare, actually. Most of the cases is that during the research, you actually need to modify your hypotheses and solutions along the way. You need to spend weeks, perhaps months doing that. And if you do well here, there might be 70% of the chance that you will actually succeed, meaning that you, you walk out with some novel and significant contributions. And there's still about 20% of the chance after step one and two, you still couldn't work things out. And for that, you probably have to quit and change something else. As I said earlier, doing research is a risk-taking activity. Okay. So how long do you hang on a project or a research idea before you quit? Well, read the book. <laughs> OK, so now let's say you have some research ideas, and you're about time to write papers. Right? Some other common mistake came up. Okay. The common mistake is this. I'm the little emperor. Well, what does that mean? Well, these are empires. One Chinese empire, one Roman empire. Well, I'm doing research, PhDs. They are like very, very sophisticated. Okay? Therefore, it's your responsibility to understand my work, some may think. Okay? When they write, write up their paper and thesis, they don't think from other person's point of view. Sometimes they think, if my paper is easy to understand, it must be too simple. So some of us may write papers that are purposely harder to read. And that's, that's bad. Okay? Well, another misconception is about peers and reviewers. Okay? I mentioned earlier that you, know, you want to submit your papers to peer-reviewed conference and journals, right? And those papers will be reviewed by researchers in the same area. And inevitably, at the very beginning, your paper could be rejected for many reasons. Okay? But one reason some student may raise is this. Reviewers are evil. Why is that? Well, they say that they reject my paper because my work is much better than theirs or their friends. <laughs> Another said, you, something, something. <laughs> I know who you are. I will get, I'll get back to you when I review your paper. <laughs> now, these, of course, are certainly bad ideas or bad misconceptions. The correct way is that we must be very accurate in reviewing other people's work. And we must be very sensitive when criticizing other people's work, others' work. True, we want to show our work is better than theirs, but we want to be very sensitive in doing that. Okay? So, how to do that? Again, it's in the book. So let me summarize. Doing research mainly consists of these three sub-steps. One is find new ideas. The second is doing solid research. The third is publish papers. And it's an iterative process. You want to start working and even try to write and write papers early on, as just mentioned. Through this iteration, what I hope is that you can use your effort to push up this, your knowledge curve so that it can be breaking the ground. You can make novel and significant contributions to the knowledge. And not only that, in four years, you also want to be independent. Okay? You, can, you, you, you become an independent thinker, and also you can do research independently. So again, here is the, here the book. Again, you can download this book free from, from the university uh, network, or you can try to get a free book from outside. There are about 15 of them. And if you have any questions in the future, you can email me. Here is my email address. At last, I wish all of you 
to be great to have a great success in the graduate studies at Western here. Thank you. Thank you.